A man walks down the street, he says, why am I soft in the middle now? Why am I soft in the middle? The rest of my life is so hard. I need a photo opportunity. I want a shot of redemption. Don't want to end up a car. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to the University of San Francisco today. I'd also like to thank the Dean of the Business School, Michael Weber, and the Associate Dean of the Business School, John Beach, for making these great events possible at USF. I also want to thank especially Valerie Gonzalez for all her great work, Margot Fry, Ilana Berkovitz, Mishara Baker, and the entire film crew, and so many others. Before we begin, could you please turn off your cell phone? I don't think people turn off their cell phones. Very good. Um, the way we're going to do this is our guest speaker will speak for about an hour, and then we'll start a Q&A session. Uh, I'll start it with a few questions, and they'll be open to the audience to ask your favorite questions. I first learned about our guest speaker when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. I was working on an honors thesis in game theory, and one name that kept cropping up was Al Roth. His work helped my work as an undergraduate. But perhaps his most interesting theoretical applied work has been in the area of mechanism design. That's how to design a system so an efficient or favorable outcome results. For example, when freshly minted doctors look for a hospital to do their residencies, doctors want to get the right hospitals and hospitals want to find the right doctors. How can you design a system that will match them up the best? Al Roth helped solve that problem. There are about 100,000 people waiting for kidney transplants. About 5% of these die waiting. A system that makes matching kidney donors with kidney patients would be extremely valuable to these people. What kind of system would get donated kidneys to patients in the most efficient way? Al Roth helped solve that problem. Students typically apply to several colleges. We've all done it. Colleges are seeking out the best students, given their own considerations. How do you ensure that students are most efficiently matched to the right schools? Dr. Roth helped solve that problem. Our guest speaker recently won the 2012 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for his work on these important topics. He's written several books, like this one on two-sided matching, which he has kindly signed and donated to our business school. Perhaps the most important application of all Al Ross work was in the mechanism design of finding his wife. <laughs> He's been happily married 37 years. Our guest speaker is truly a phenomenal person. Please give a warm welcome for Dr. Al Ross. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And Ludwig has just given my whole talk, so I'll try to fill in some details now. Because uh, I want to tell you about market design. And to do that, let, let me start by thinking a little bit about markets. Because in lots of markets, prices don't do all the work. So we all know about commodity markets. When you want to buy uh, number two red winter wheat on the Chicago Board of Trade, all that matters is the price. But and, and if you can afford it, you can buy 5,000 bushels for delivery in December. But in lots of markets, prices don't do all the work. Prices may be important, but they're not what decides who gets what. So Stanford and University of, of San Francisco don't choose their entering class by raising the tuition until just enough people remain who want to come. The, it's expensive to go to an American university, but, um, but the prices are low enough so that lots of people would like to go and the universities select from, from those who apply. Uh, so they don't, they're not setting the price so that supply equals demand. And the same thing is true in labor markets. Right? Uh, the, the example I like to give is that you can't just tell Google that you're coming to work there, and neither can Google tell you that you're coming to work there. Right? It's, uh, both of these you know, college admissions and labor markets are a lot like marriage. You can't just choose your spouse. You also have to be chosen. And so that's what makes a market a matching market. You can't just choose what you want. Even if you can afford it, you also have to be chosen. Right? So jobs are like that. You can't just tell Google you're going to work, and Google can't 
tell you they have to compete with Facebook. Stanford has to compete with Berkeley. So these are markets where there are marketplace institutions that involve courtship on both sides, application procedures, admissions procedures, selection procedures. And I, I was on the Stanford campus this morning, and the campus is full of crowds of young people walking around behind someone walking backwards explaining what the buildings are. Uh, and these are, are people being wooed to come to Stanford, their, their potential freshmen and their parents, uh, as part of the courtship process. So I'm going to tell you about each of the markets that, that Ludwig mentioned. But as I do that, let's keep in mind some of the things that marketplaces have to do. Because the, the kind of economic engineering that I do, which, which we call market design, might better be called marketplace design. You design marketplaces. And they're, they're meant to facilitate the market. So what does a marketplace have to do? Well, it has to help the market be thick. It has to bring enough people to the marketplace to transact with each other so that it becomes a, a desirable place to go and do your transactions. And then once the market is thick, it, it sometimes gets congested. There are so many potential transactions because so many people are coming to the marketplace that it's hard to evaluate them and figure out which ones would be good ones. And so the market has to, to help you deal with congestion. So think about a big marketplace like Amazon, which is thick. Lots of people come to Amazon. It's hard to find things on Amazon. It would be impossible if they didn't have search engines. Right? So, that, so the search engine is a way of helping you deal with the congestion that results from the thick market that Amazon has created. And then it has to be safe to participate in. Right? You have to, it's safe to make your credit tra card transactions, safe to make your transactions there instead of going to some other marketplace. And it has to be safe for you to reveal the information that you're interested in the, the information that, that about what you want that, that will allow the market to find an efficient transaction. So I'm going to give you some examples of markets. Every marketplace has to solve all of these problems. But when I talk to you about particular marketplaces today, I'm going to give you some examples that emphasize these different things. So I'm going to, to tell you about making a market thick. I'm going to tell you about uh, the market for new doctors, to tell you about dealing with um, with, with safety, I'm going to tell you about some school choice systems that, that we've helped fix. Um, to tell you about congestion, I'm going to tell you about the market for new PhD economists. And when I get to kidney exchange, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some other things as well, which is, and, and I think this is very clear in kidney exchange, but, not, but, but present in other markets as well. It turns out one of the things we learned from market design is that People have strong intuitions about what kinds of transactions are okay to do. And so there are some transactions that are regarded as repugnant. I'm going to call a transaction repugnant if some people would like to do it and other people don't think they should. And the way that will come up in kidney exchange is kidney exchange is, is all in-kind exchange because it's a felony in the United States to buy and sell kidneys. You can't pay money for a kidney for transplant. So at the end of my talk, I'll spend a little time thinking about that. And, and it turns out that's not special about kidneys. Um, we have a lot of opinions as a society about what kinds of things should be bought and sold and what shouldn't. And so I'll, I want to talk about that too. And incidentally, I mean, I, sh I should mention, and I sort of say on the slide there, is that um, you know, people have strong opinions about what can be bought and sold. Economists train ourselves not to have good intuitions on that subject. Right? Economists sort of think that everything can be bought and sold. And, but, but as a social scientist, I can tell you it's going to be important for us to understand other people's opinions, not just economists' opinions on this. OK, so I've worked on a number of uh, marketplaces. And I'm going to tell you about the, the market for medical residents for new doctors. And the, the focus I'll have there is on establishing a thick marketplace. I'm going to tell you about the market for new PhD economists, probably not in that order. Uh, and the focus there will be on making it safe to reveal the information that will allow the market to find an efficient match. And then I'll tell you about school choice systems. And the, uh, oh, actually, there'll, there'll be a safety issue there, too. You know, the, the, all of these marketplaces have to solve all of these issues, but I'll emphasize different ones. And then I'll tell you about kidney exchange. So let me tell you about the market for new doctors a little bit. Because it had a long history of market failure. Turns out, um, right now, the way doctors get their jobs is they go through a centralized clearinghouse. But it, but it wasn't always like that. 
So only around 1900 did doctors start having what were then called internships and are now called residencies at hospitals as their first job. Before 1900, when you graduated from a medical school or even when you didn't, uh, medicine was, was much less regulated in those days, uh, you could start to practice medicine. But today, before you can be licensed in any state in the United States, you have to complete at least some years of what's called a residency, which is a, a job where, where you're working in a hospital, but you're supervised by more experienced physicians. And around 1900, and, and in the decades right after, the way people looked for these jobs and the way hospitals hired their residents was you waited until you graduated from medical school and then you looked around for a job. But competition among hospitals started to force that job market earlier and earlier. So around 1930, you look in the medical journals and you find that, that most people are being hired about Christmas time of their senior year in medical school. And some of the, uh, the hospitals were worried that this was hiring people a little too early. You didn't know how they were going to do in their senior year. You didn't know their class ranking. And so you look in the medical journals and there's lots of, of jawboning about, you know, okay, we're hiring pretty early, but we shouldn't go any earlier. But it's hard when the incentives are to go a little bit earlier than your competitors, it's hard to stop people from doing it just by talking to them. So by 1940, the usual time at which doctors were being hired was two years before graduation. Okay? And that's terribly inefficient because uh, as a medical student, you might think you wanted to be a surgeon, and maybe I'm a surgeon and I'm looking for surgical residents, and you got an A in anatomy, so it seems like you'd be a great surgeon, as near as I can tell, after two years of medical school, so I hire you and, and you are glad to be hired because that's when the jobs are going. But in your third year, when you actually go to some surgeries, you discover that you faint at the sight of blood. So, you know, you're going to be a terrible surgeon and we're going to be unhappy with each other. But it's too late. You know, all the, all the good medical students have been hired and all the good jobs have been taken. So, so they understood that this was a problem, but they were having trouble stopping it. And around 1940, the medical schools intervened and they said, you know, we're going to help. They're a third party, not the doctors and not the hospitals. We're going to help you not go so early by not releasing any information about students, no transcripts, no letters of reference. So that, that worked, but then they discovered that they had lots of congestion. They had exploding offers. You know, people would get offers that they had to answer immediately. It took a while for that to happen, but, but I, I won't tell you that whole story. But eventually, in the 1950s, they... Uh, they started a marketplace of the form that if you have friends who are graduating from medical school, they'll go through today. That is, what they started in the 1950s was a labor market clearinghouse. And doctors who graduate from medical school now, around February, after interviewing at lots of places, they submit a rank order list of preference. Here's my first choice job, here's my second choice, here's my third choice. And the hospitals, the residency programs, do the same thing. Here's our first choice applicant. Here's our second choice. Here's our third choice. And then something happens. I, I might get to tell you a little more about what happens when I talk about school choice. Uh, some, th those, the market design has to do in part with the design of the algorithm that processes those preferences uh, and suggests a match. And initially that was a very successful match because it turned out to be a good design, but it got less and less successful over time. And the reason it got less successful over time had to do with the fact that in the 1950s when they started, the percentage of women in American medical schools was around 0%. And along around the 1970s, it, it crept up to near 10%. And what you started seeing was that some of the people going on the residency market were married to each other. And they wanted to have jobs in the same region. And the system that had been set up in the 1950s when, when it was only men, was not putting them in the same region necessarily. And, um, and they weren't accepting their matches. Right? So, so what they found was that couples were defecting from the match. And um, today, you know, nowadays, we have about 17,000 graduates of American medical schools. And about 1,800 of them go through the matches couples, 900 couples. Right? So one of the ways the, um, the match changed, one of the ways the marketplace changed, is there started to be couples on the market, two career households, who needed to find two jobs. And so part of the information that the marketplace has to allow them to give is what are their preferences among two jobs. Loosely speaking, I'm not going to go right into the, the technicalities of the match, but loosely speaking, the problem the match was having when it was set up for just single people was they would ask you, what's your first choice job? What's your second choice job? Well, if they ask, this and, if they ask you this and they ask your spouse this, you might not get jobs together. 
and the and and at some point they they started to try to fix that. They would they had an algorithm where in the 1970s where a couple had to declare one member of the couple as the leading member. The leading member then went through the match, and the other member uh, had his or her uh, preference list edited to take away places that weren't in the same city. And so you would get two jobs in the same city, but you might not be very happy. That is, you know, maybe my wife and I get a good job in Boston and a bad job in Boston. Now, the iron law of marriage is you can't be happier than your spouse. So, so if we get a good job in Boston and a bad job in Boston, we're not happy and we get on the phone. And it might be that our, you know, our first choice was two good jobs in Boston, but our next choice is two good jobs in New York. So we call them up and we see if we can arrange it. So people started not accepting their match offers and that led to a ripple effect which required a redesign of the clearinghouse. And that's, I got a call sitting in my office at the University of Pittsburgh in 1995 and that led to my interest in market design. But one of the things we did was we redesigned the match to address this problem of couples. And it's been pretty successful. There are lots of medical marketplaces that, that use the algorithms that we designed to, to handle the problems of couples. Um, and again, it's a window on, on the medical marketplace. There are lots of couples in the residency. There are very few couples who are both thoracic surgeons, I can tell you. So, um, so markets evolve in lots of interesting ways, and as they evolve, the requirements of their marketplaces change. Now, let me tell you about a similar problem that happens much earlier in people's career uh, when, the, when it's time to choose schools. So I'll start by telling you about Boston, although that's not the, the city that we started. We first started in New York. So Boston had a centralized clearinghouse for assigning children to schools. The way they, what they did, like superficially like the medical match, they asked families to say, what's your first choice school, what's your second choice school, what's your third choice school? Okay, and then they had a very simple to describe, I'm now gonna describe it, and a very benign sounding way of processing that information. Okay, each school had priorities for certain kinds of students set through the political process. So the priorities would be, the first priority would be if you had a sibling, if you had an older child already attending that school, your child would have very high priority to attend. They, they understood that you wanted to have one drop off at 8 a.m. The next priority was walk zone. If you lived near the school, you'd have some priority for it. And then they assigned everyone a lottery number to break ties when a school got more applications than it had places and they couldn't fit in all the people with the same priority, they would break priority in random order. And the method they have of, of assigning was, again, this very simple, benign method. They, they tried to give as many people their first choice as possible. Okay, that was their plan. They would try to give as many people as first choice as possible. When they couldn't give everyone their first choice, they would use these priorities, sibling, walk zone, and lottery, to decide which kids got into their first choice. Once they'd assigned as many people as they could to their first choices, they looked at whoever was left and they tried to assign them to their second choices. Once they'd assigned as many people to their second choice as they could, they tried to assign as many people to their third choice. So it's a very simple algorithm to describe, but it turns out to be a very hard one to participate in because you, it's not safe, it wasn't safe, to tell Boston what your preferences were, your true preferences over schools, because if you didn't get your first choice, if you didn't get the choice that you said was your first choice, there was a very good chance that your second choice was going to be filled by people who had said it was their first choice. <coughs> so you had to be really careful to choose as your first choice a school that you could get. Not the school that you wanted the most, not the one that was your first choice, but one you could be sure of getting because if you didn't get your first choice, your second choice, for which you might have a lot of priority, you might have a child already going to that school, you might be in the walk zone, but it would be filled up with people who had listed it as their first choice. So you couldn't simply reveal your information to the school board. You know, the, the, we live across from a great half-day kindergarten, but we'd really like a full-day kindergarten. So our first choice is not the school that we're in the walk zone, it's some other school. You couldn't afford to say that. So, so in New York, they had a similar problem, but it worked on both sides. It, worked for, it, it was a problem for both families and for schools. So, in New York, the way they, they, they had a decentralized process, but the way it worked was, it no longer works this way, but the way it worked was you, um, you wrote down on a form 
your first choice, second choice, and third choice. They Xerox those forms and they sent them to the schools. So as a school principal, I would know not only that you had applied to me, but I could see where I was in your ranking. I could see that you had applied to me as your third choice. So that allowed me to have a policy if I'm the principal of Aviation High School between LaGuardia Airport and Kennedy Airport where they specialize in careers in aviation. I could say, you know, I'm only going to admit kids who rank me as my first choice. So as in Boston, what that meant is you didn't have as many choices as you appeared to have. You couldn't get into aviation high school if you ranked it as your second choice. But they had another problem in New York where the schools were very active participants, where they could have preferences over students, is that the principals weren't revealing all their spots. They would, they would withhold capacity. They'd say, you know, the, the big classroom on the first floor is under construction. We don't know if it'll be uh, finished in time. We might not be able to admit kids for that class. So. Um, the, and, and this was well understood, so the, you know, the directory, the instructions for families said, you know, determine what your competition is uh, for a seat in a program before you tell us what's your first choice, second choice, and third choice. That is, they're saying, don't just think about how much you like the school, think about whether you can get in. And, you know, here's a quote from a deputy chancellor saying, this was a, an extreme case, but he said, you know, you might have a school that had 100 spots, but they'd only declare 40 of them. And then after the match had gone on, they would discover the other 60 and they would uh, admit kids in what they called an over-the-counter process. And what that meant was the match wasn't assigning kids to where they were actually going. When you looked at where the children were in September, they were in different places than they had been admitted in the match. And both of these issues involved finding an algorithm that would eliminate these blocking pairs. I'll come back and talk about blocking pairs, but, but what's going on here is well, you can see from, from the superficial evidence that the, the principals were, were thinking, you know, there are kids we'd like to have assigned to us who would like to come to our school, but if we get all our kids through the match, we're not going to get them. So if we withhold some places, we'll find children we like better than the ones who would be assigned to us through the centralized system. So it wasn't safe for families to reveal their preferences, and it wasn't safe for principals to reveal their capacities. But they now use a centralized clearinghouse that in many ways is very like the medical centralized clearinghouse. And one of the big things it does is it makes it safe to reveal your true preferences. And the way it does this is it has the property that if you don't get your first choice, your chance of getting your second choice is exactly the same as if you had listed it as your first choice. Okay, so it has the property that, that the, the algorithm has the property that it doesn't care at what point you apply to a school. Once you've applied, the preferences that school has for you allow you to bump kids who might have applied earlier. So it's a harder to describe algorithm, but it's easier to play because you can say to families nowadays in New York and Boston, it's safe to figure out your preferences for schools and rank the schools that way. So instead of having to figure out how hard it is to get into a school, nowadays you can figure out, you know, if you're in Boston, you can figure out which kindergartens have teachers who are good with shy boys or whatever you've got. And, and that way you can spend your, your time thinking about which schools you like. And of course, it's a lot easier to judge whether the school match is doing a good job if we know what schools you would like your kids in than if we don't. Now, th that's had a, one indirect effect. One way you can tell it's doing a good job is here's a, a picture of the the results of the match for the first four years in New York. Now, the first four years that we had the match, starting in, in 2004, um, not too much changed, except in 2004 there was a new algorithm. But what you can see from this picture is that the number of people getting their first choice increased for the first three years. The number of people getting their first or second choice increased. The number of people getting their first, second, or third choice increased. So it looks magical. It looks like there are more schools that people want. What's going on? What's going on is the principals are learning not to withhold the places. So the, the good places are coming back into the system and getting allocated by the match as principals learn that the match gave them students they liked at least as well as the ones they could get through the over-the-counter process. So the match has to serve both sides of the, of, of the two-sided matching market. And that's what makes it safe for both sides to participate. And in New York, you had to make it safe for the school principals as well as for the students because they, they were both strategic players with, with big strategy sets. If there's time, I'll come back and tell you at the end how these algorithms work. I think there will be time. 
Um, the market for new PhD economists has a, has a different problem, right? So think about the market for schools. There's no problem getting thickness. If you are 14 years old and you live in New York City, you must go to high school, right? So there's plenty of demand for New York City high schools. But there was a congestion problem, okay? And the way the congestion problem manifested itself in New York, what, what they did before we, we helped them with a computerized clearinghouse, in New York, they, they operated their, their old selection system through the mail. And so students who, so, so there are about 90,000 students a year who go to high school in New York City. About 17,000 of them got multiple offers. The high schools did separate admissions. They would get letters that say, you've been admitted to high school A, B, and C. Please reply and tell us which one you want to go to. And if you want to be on the waiting list for another high school. So it would take a while for them to reply. You have to check. If you don't get the mail back, you have to, if you're the school system, you have to check and say, you know, we sent you a letter. Which high school do you want to go to? That takes some time. Once, once they get the reply, that frees up some new spaces. So new letters can be sent out to saying, you've been admitted to the following high schools. Which ones do you want to go to? And the process took long enough that they still had 30,000 kids unassigned in August, and they had to assign them without regard to their preferences. So nowadays, we only have about 3,000 kids like that in New York. There, there, there's some irreducible number of kids who don't submit preferences and things like that. So with economists, the congestion takes a somewhat different form. The way economists get their job, and I'm, I'm going through this process right now with, with people about to get their PhD at, at Stanford, and I still have some students at Harvard. Um, what those guys are doing now is they're finishing up their job market papers, and they're starting to apply. And around Thanksgiving, um, recruiting committees around the country at universities like this one are going to be looking at the applications from economists. And they're going to be thinking, we need to interview some of these guys. And the way we do that is we go to the annual meetings of the American Economic Association, which this year is in Philadelphia. And we'll get a hotel suite. And we'll sit in it for three days. And we'll interview about 20 or 25 people. Uh, working pretty hard, you know, interviewing them for 45 minutes each and then talking about them afterward. And we get lots of applications, but we can only interview 25 people. And the question is, which ones should we interview? So there's a congestion problem. The market is thick. Lots of people apply to lots of uh, places because it's now cheap and electronic to apply for jobs. So the fact that you get an application from someone is not a strong indication of interest. It's not a strong indication that you could hire them. And so before I, so at, at Harvard, we didn't worry about that too much. We assumed that everyone at least potentially was interested in, in coming to Harvard. But before I was at Harvard, I was at the University of Pittsburgh, which is a lot more like the University of San Francisco. And what we understood is if we interviewed the same people who Harvard interviewed, then we'd come home without hiring anyone. So what we were interested in is getting some sense of not just how much we like them, but how much they liked us. So the same kind of problem that, that parents were facing in Boston when, when who you said was your first choice mattered a lot. And it's hard to figure out because since it's cheap to make applications, all the cover letters say, you know, I'd really like to come and work with you, you know, come and interview me and, uh, you know, I'm available. So, um, and of course you see this on dating sites as well, say internet dating sites, you know, part of the problem with, uh, with congestion on a, on a big internet dating site like Match.com is that uh, women, in particular, with attractive pictures, get many more emails than they can answer. And so, uh, so it's a congested site. So what we did in, I, I, I was chair of an American Economic Association Committee on the Job Market, we, we created a website that allows people to send two signals of particular interest. So you can send out 100 job applications, but you can only send two signals. And what those signals are meant to say is, you know, you might not have thought that I was a, a high value guy to interview, but take another look because I think we might be a good match. And um, if you look at the, if, if you rank universities, there are lots of reputational rankings of universities. If you rank them from, you know, one to 500, what you see about the signals is there aren't that many signals to the very top universities. These are in groups of five here. Uh, because it doesn't make any sense to send a signal of interest to Harvard. At Harvard, we always assumed that at least potentially we had a shot at you. 
But at Pittsburgh, you know, we would be very interested in whether you might be interested in us. So what you see is there are some bumps uh, at the beginning, but then it levels out. It does a good job of helping solve the coordination problem. That is, if, you get a, if, if you're in that long distribution, what you're seeing is that the people who are sending you signals are different from the people who are, the signals aren't all concentrated at one university. And that is the, the job seekers have some information which might help you figure out who to interview. Even though they've sent out 100 uh, applications, they're sort of thinking to themselves, you know, if I don't get one of those jobs at the best interviews I have, where would I like to go? And so that information is very valuable. One of the, th these are American uh, universities in this picture, but one set of universities that's proved very sensitive to signals and has started putting in their job ads, you know, we're, we're, they, they say, you know, signal us if you're interested because we really pay attention to that, are British universities. The reason British universities are interested in signals is because it's cheap to apply to places, lots of um, new American PhDs apply to British universities. And as far as the British universities are concerned, there are two kinds of applications, and they would like to distinguish between them. Some of them are from people who would really be quite happy to go teach in England and understand that there are wonderful universities in England. And others are from people who would, you know, absolutely prefer to be in North America and would only go to England, you know, as a, it, as a terrible disappointment if they couldn't get a job in the United States. And the British universities are, have a problem distinguishing those in a way that, say, German universities don't, because everyone who gets a PhD in the United States can speak English and so could teach at a British university, whereas if you could teach at a German university, they can tell from, from other parts of your dossier from the fact that you speak German. So, so the British universities really want signals, and this is not just the, the lower-ranking universities. You know, Oxford is, is extremely interested in signals because they're worried that they might get applications from people who would only go to Oxford if they can't get any job in the United States. But, if, but once you send them a signal, they understand that you know that Oxford is a very serious university and that, that you might go there if they made you an offer. So this is another way of dealing with congestion. It's congestion in interviewing. And what makes these signals credible is that they're scarce. They don't cost anything. They're free. But you only have two. Okay? And I mentioned dating sites. Uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, Muriel Needley and Sue Lee, did an experiment on a Korean dating site, and they gave people signals, roses they called them, virtual roses. And it turns out you can send lots of emails, but you could only send a very small number of emails that had roses attached. And what they found is that emails with roses attached got a lot more attention than, uh, than emails that were mass produced. So, so far I've told you about easing congestion, I've told you about making it safe to reveal your information, and I've told you about making the market thick in the medical market. You know, the, the problem with the medical market, the reason it wasn't thick is they were hiring people earlier and earlier, so people were getting exploding offers that didn't allow them to compare offers. You'd get an early offer when you were still in your second year of medical school or just finished it, and, um, and you wouldn't have time to wait and get other offers before you had to accept. So now I want to tell you about a market where, where all of those things come up a little bit. I want to tell you about kidney exchange. And kidney exchange, in a certain sense, is going to be more like school choice than like the medical labor market or the economic labor market, because labor markets are matching markets, but, they have, but, but wages, you know, prices are very important. Right? They don't determine who gets what. They, the, they don't determine who becomes an assistant professor at Stanford. But of course, if Stanford didn't pay a decent wage, then no one would want to come. But school choice for public schools, we obviously, you know, it's a right of citizenship. We don't sell places at good public schools. And it turns out you can't sell kidneys. That doesn't mean it's not costly to get a kidney. Care for kidney patients is a $50 billion a year industry in the United States, right? The Medicare portion devoted to kidneys is $8 billion a year. It's the biggest single program in Medicare. So there's big money, um, but there's a shortage of kidneys. Okay, and the treatment of choice is transplantation, right? So there's dialysis that will keep you alive, but kidney exchange is close to a cure. Uh, but at the moment, there are almost 100,000 people waiting for deceased donor organs. So if you have driver's licenses in California, you can look at your driver's license, and if you're registered as a donor, there'll be a little circle on it that says donor. And, you know, you, if, if you're not registered, you can go online and to... to donatelife.gov, I think, and uh, 
and register, and that's a good thing to do. Um, but deceased donors, there aren't enough of them. Even if everyone registered, only about 45% of Americans are registered. But even if 100% were registered, mostly when you die, your organs die with you. So it's only rare cases that, that organs become available. But it turns out that with kidneys, live donation is also possible. Right? So we, healthy people have two kidneys and can remain healthy with just one. So if someone you love is, has kidney failure, is dying of kidney disease, you could donate an organ if you're healthy enough, if you're healthy in the right way, if you don't have diabetes, if you don't have high blood pressure, if you don't have protein in your urine, you could remain healthy with just one kidney. But sometimes, oh, and, and incidentally, right now in the United States, last year we had about 11,000 some odd transplants from deceased donors, and we had about 6,000 some odd transplants from living donors. And what that means is the, the modal donor in the United States is a living donor. We still get more transplants from deceased donors, but that's because deceased donors donate two kidneys. Living donors donate only one. So, so we have more than half of the transplants are coming from living donors. So it's a very real possibility. It's a pretty safe operation, a nephrectomy. Uh, you could give someone you loved a, uh, a kidney. But sometimes you're healthy enough to give a kidney, but the person you love can't take your kidney. You're incompatible. And you can be incompatible for a number of reasons, the most common of which is blood type incompatibility. You don't have compatible blood types. Another is tissue type incompatibility. You, you're, the person who you love, who you want to give a kidney to, has some antibodies that their immune system would, would fight your kidney. So for example, if I didn't know my blood type, the chance that one of you could take my kidney would be um, slightly above 50%. But the chance that my wife can take my kidney is only about 30%. And that's because my wife and I are parents. And in the course of childbirth, not pregnancy, but childbirth, her immune system might have become exposed to some of the proteins that our boys inherit from me. And in that case, her, her immune system might have developed antibodies that would be waiting to attack my kidney if it should appear, because it would have some of these proteins that, that she would have existing antibodies to. So sometimes you are healthy enough to give someone a kidney, but the person you love can't take your kidney. And this is what opens up the possibility of exchange. I could give a kidney to the person you love, but can't give a kidney to, and you could give a kidney to the person I love, but can't give a kidney to. And so the simplest kind of exchange is with blood type incompatibility. So here we've got a picture of a simple exchange where Pair one, donor one and recipient one, don't have the same blood type. And you, a blood type A can't give to a blood type B person. And donor two and recipient two have the same problem in reverse. So if we could get them together, we could make sure that the blood type B patient, recipient one, gets a blood type B kidney, and the blood type A patient uh, gets a blood type A kidney. Right? So it's a simple exchange. So you can see that this is an, it's an exchange. It's a natural problem for economists to deal with because we study exchange. I have to tell you that when we first started approaching surgeons, they didn't automatically view economists as fellow members of the helping professions. <laughs> but notice that this is an in-kind exchange. And that's because of what I mentioned before about repugnant transactions. It's a felony in the United States to pay money for a kidney for transplant. It costs a lot to get a transplant, but you can't buy the kidney. So here's a, a, a sentence from the 1984 National Organ Transplant Act, which says, unlawful for any person to acquire any human organ for valuable consideration for use, use in human transplantation. So you might worry that this looks like valuable consideration. But it doesn't just say you can't buy and sell a kidney. The law says you can't. It seems to say you can't get something valuable in return for a kidney. And you know, here you are, you're giving a kidney and you're getting a kidney. So that looks pretty valuable. Um, when we started doing kidney exchange in 2004, the Justice Department declined to write a memo saying that it was legal. So one of the heroes of this is a surgeon in Ohio named Mike Reese, and he said, you know, one of my kidney transplant patients is the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Ohio. I could get him to prosecute me. And then the courts would show that it was legal. And, you know, everyone who loves Mike said, no, no, don't do that. There's no telling what the courts would do. So eventually we got an amendment to the note. We'd been doing kidney exchange for a couple of years, but eventually we got the, the Charlie Norwood Living Organ Donation Act, which says the preceding sentence, that sentence, does not apply to human organ pair donation, which is the legal phrase for kidney exchange that avoids the word exchange. So 
people are very sensitive about what can be exchanged and what can't. Incidentally, you know, market design teaches you lots of things. You know, so I've learned lots of things I didn't expect to learn as an economist. And one of them is the difficulty of passing legislation in the United States. <laughs> no one opposed this act. When it eventually passed, it passed by acclaim. No one voted against it in either the House or the Senate. But it took three years to pass. The first year, it didn't get to a vote. It has to be reintroduced the next year. The second year, it didn't get to a vote. It had to be introduced the third year. Charlie Norwood was a congressman from Georgia. He was the sponsor in the House. He had had a transplant. And in the third year, he died of a transplant-related disease. And his colleagues named the act after him and passed it. So it's not easy to get legislation. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about congestion in kidney exchange. That simple exchange I show you, I'm, I'm watching one here, I'm the man in the yellow gown and I'm keeping my hands out of the way so that no one hands me anything. And the, in, in, the, in the bucket in front of me in this picture on the left is a kidney. Now behind me, not in the picture on the right, but, but to the right of the picture on the left, off screen, is another operating room, just steps away. And in that operating room, there's just been a nephrectomy, uh, a kidney removal. And in this operating room, the kidney is being prepared for a transplantation. And this is happening in Cincinnati, Ohio. And at the same time, in Toledo, Ohio, that's where Mike Reese works, the guy who was willing to be prosecuted, um, they're doing the same thing with her patient and his donor. Right? So the donor from Toledo has traveled to Cincinnati to give a kidney here, and the, the uh, the donor from Cincinnati has traveled to Toledo to give a kidney there. And when I say they're doing it at the same time, they prepared the patients, they anesthetized them, they made the initial incisions, and then they get on the phone and they say, we're ready here in Cincinnati, are you ready in Toledo? And when they're told that they are, they go ahead. And the reason they do it simultaneously is you can't give valuable consideration for a kidney. You can't sign a contract on a kidney. So in order to make sure everything goes through, they have to do it simultaneously. So that means that to do the simplest exchange requires four operating rooms, two nephrectomies and two transplants, and four surgical teams. It requires a lot of stuff. So it's hard to do even a small exchange. And if you wanted to do a bigger exchange, here's a three-way exchange, you'd need six operating rooms. So you can see that as the market becomes thick, as more and more people come who might be able to engage in exchange, it's going to get congested. It's going to be hard to do all the things you need to do to do the transactions that you'd like to do. Incidentally, let me just tell you a, a, a quick story about nephrectomies. Uh, there was a time where it was really major surgery, but now um, the surgeries I've seen are hand-assisted laparoscopic nephrectomies. So what that means is the surgeon looks like he's playing a video game. He, he's got two small incisions, uh, one of which has a light, a bright light, which, and he's watching what's going on on a screen, and you can watch it with him if you're in the room with him. And the other has got a, a, a little scissors uh, that, that he operates sort of robotically that's, that's hot, so it cauterizes whatever it cuts. And there's a third incision, the big one, that's just big enough for another surgeon to get his gloved hand into the cavity. And he's putting tension on tissues so that they can be cut. And then, like a magic trick, the kidney comes out in his hand. So that's what those surgeries look like. Anyway, if you wanted to do a three-way exchange, you'd need six operating rooms. And these days, we sometimes want to consider even more complicated exchanges that involve non-directed donors. So what I've got here is a picture that's a picture of what, when we look at our data, we call a compatibility graph. Each circle is going to represent some incompatible patient-donor pair, a patient and her donors. And the arrows will go from one to another, one circle to another, if a kidney can go there. If the donor in one pair can give a kidney to, a, to the patient in another pair. So what you see here in this stylized compatibility graph is we could get a three-way exchange, we could get a two-way exchange, and we've got this chain that starts with what I'm calling a non-directed donor. So deceased donors are non-directed. If you're registered in California to be a donor and you die in a way that makes your organs available, you haven't indicated to whom it should go. And increasingly we're seeing non-directed living donors, okay, people who, who present themselves and say, I would like to give a kidney to someone, but I don't have anyone particular in mind. Well, when you do that, you go through lots of both physical and psychological screens, but we're getting more and more of those. Um, about a third of them are from faith-based groups, incidentally. Another big group are policemen and firemen, right? So again, it gives you an interesting window on the United States. 
Um, now, what we used to do when we had non-directed donors is we used to say, once they passed through all these screens, we used to say, you know, you can give a kidney to someone on the, trans on the waiting list, to a patient on the waiting list. Now we say, you know, your gift might, this non-directed donor, that's, that's the beginning of this chain, your gift might facilitate a lot of transplants. You could give a kidney to a patient donor pair that's waiting for exchange but hasn't found one. They could give a kidney to another patient donor pair, and the donor in that pair could give to someone who's been waiting a long time for a deceased donor organ. So when you look at a picture like that in real life, it looks like this. And the question is, why are there only six people in the picture? And the reason, this is, this is back in 2007, the reason is uh, we, were, we were still doing all those surgeries simultaneously. And the reason we do them simultaneously is you can't give valuable consideration for a kidney. We wanted to make sure all the parts would go through. But with a non-directed donor, we started to say, you know, let's do a simple cost-benefit analysis, simplest kind of economics. Let's see whether we really have to do those simultaneously and whether the cost of not doing them simultaneously might be offset by the benefit. So let me remind you what the cost is, why we always do simple exchanges simultaneously. So on the left, I've got a simple two-way exchange, the kind I showed you before between the AB pair and the BA pair. Supposing we didn't do them simultaneously. We always do them simultaneously. Supposing we didn't. Well, on day one, donor two gives a kidney to recipient one. And on day two, for whatever reason, donor one fails to give a kidney to recipient two. That's what that broken line is. And the big X means that donor two no longer has a kidney. So pair two has really suffered a very bad event, right? They've given a kidney, but they haven't gotten one. So they've had a surgery which didn't help them, and it's not a, it's not a dangerous surgery, but it's not a trivial one. But worse yet, they no longer have a kidney. So when we do another kidney exchange next week, they can't participate because they don't have a kidney to offer. So we never let that happen. We always do those simultaneously. But now let's suppose we're going to start a chain with a living non-directed donor. And supposing we decide to do those on consecutive days. So on day one, the, the, the non-directed donor gives a kidney to recipient one. And on day two, for whatever reason, same reason as in the other picture, donor one fails to give a kidney to recipient two. So that's pretty bad. It's disappointing, but it's not tragic because pair two hasn't given a kidney yet. They haven't had a surgery. They still have a kidney. Next week, when we run another kidney exchange, they'll participate. So the cost of a broken link is a lot less when we have a non-directed donor chain than when we have an exchange. Since the cost is less, we can think what the benefit would be. And the first non-simultaneous donor chain was reported in 2009, but was done in 2007. It had 20 people in it. Mike Reese is the surgeon who organized this. That's one of the reasons I think he's a hero. Um, you know, here's what they look like you know, in the flesh. And what's going on here is that chains are important because a lot of kidney patients are highly sensitized. They have a lot of antibodies. So it's not just the blood type that stops them from getting your kidney. It's, it's all those antibodies, right? So if you've had a previous kidney transplant, if you've had a lot of blood transfusions, you might have had an opportunity to develop a lot of antibodies to a lot of proteins, okay? Uh, whoops, something uh, is going on with my computer. Let's see. I don't want to update now. <laughs> uh, this wouldn't be a, it's not even my computer. <laughs> Let's not update now. Ludwig, I think we're about to update your computer. Just minimize it. Minimize it. Just minimize it. Okay. Minimize it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Um, you'll just have to update it some other time. Um, okay. So, so pools are becoming highly sensitized. So here's an actual piece of a compatibility graph. These are data that we deal with when we look at patients. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of patient donor pairs, all of whom have blood type A. So the Patients have blood type A and the donors have blood type A. This is a, a little snapshot of some of our, our kidney data. And, but the reason I've taken this snapshot is there's no blood type incompatibility, right? They're all blood type A. Everybody, as far as blood type is concerned, can give a kidney to everyone else. But you see that there are arrows going to where the kidneys can go. And the arrows almost all go to these blue nodes, to these low sensitized patients. The high sensitized patients they have no arrows going in. Their donors can give kidneys, but they can, they can hardly take any kidneys. So there are no cycles that are made up of the highly sensitized patients of whom are most of the patients there. If you imagine this graph, these data, being made of corks and string or something, so you could pick it up and shake it, 
So you pick up the blue nodes and you shake it and you get something that looks like this jellyfish. Right? At the top are the low sensitized patients. They're densely connected. They can give kidneys and receive kidneys. And then you have these long chains hanging down, which is if pa patients are highly sensitized, it means if there are a lot of you, supposing you're all highly sensitized, well, my donor can maybe give, because there are so many of you, can maybe give a kidney to one of you. But right? each of you has a really low chance of being able to take my donor's kidney, but one of you can because there are so many. Now, what's the chance that your donor can give me a kidney? I'm also highly sensitized. Well, it's very low, but there's a lot of people in the room, so your donor can give someone else a kidney. And their donor, what's the chance that they can give me a kidney? Very low, but they can give someone else a kidney. So that's how we generate a chain. Ah, thanks. Okay, so, so it's a little bit like that jellyfish where we're going to see a lot of chains. And indeed, uh, many of the transplants we're doing come from chains now, and the chains are getting very long. Here's a chain with 60 people in it. Okay, that's 30 nephrectomies and 30 transplants. The person in the top left is a non-directed donor. Okay, so a whole lot of kidney surgeries, of kidney transplants, of kidney donation is being facilitated now through these non-directed donor chains, which we no longer do simultaneously. We could never get 60 operating rooms and surgical teams going at the same time. So one of the ways we've dealt with congestion is by removing the need to do all the surgeries simultaneously. Okay, so let me end by thinking about this other question. You know, my colleague Gary Becker at the University of Chicago says, you know, there's no shortage of kidneys. You've all got two. You only need one. What the reason we don't, you know, so, so the reason there's not enough supply to meet the demand is that the price is too low, right? By law, the price is zero. Kidneys have to be gifts. So the question is, what's going on here? Well, you know, I don't know the answer, but I think that it's something that we have to study pretty seriously. For one reason is, you know, making markets illegal doesn't make them go away. It's not impossible to buy a kidney. The only place in the world I know of that has a fully legal market is the Islamic Republic of Iran. But in most places, it's illegal to buy a kidney. In some places, there are gray markets. It's not clear what the legal status is. But in many places, there are black markets, including the United States, although it seems to be relatively under control in the United States. Um, in China, uh, I, I was recently at the Ministry of Health in Beijing, and they speak of getting more than 60% of their organs from executed prisoners. Uh, some of my colleagues here think the percentage is much higher than that. So, in most parts of the world, it's illegal to buy and sell a kidney. Not because no one wants to buy kidneys, and not because no one wants to sell them. That's why they are black market. So let's call a transaction repugnant if some people want to engage in it, and other people don't think they should be allowed to. And it seems to me repugnant transactions are a really important thing for economists to study and try to understand. Because there are a lot of them, and they have been important throughout history. But they're hard to study because they're different in different places so, and, and at different times. So here in, so let me, let me take you through a couple of repugnant transactions. Here in California, we've just had a bunch of back and forths between the legislature and the courts about whether uh, same-sex marriage will be permitted in California, and it is. And um, Illinois and Hawaii are now sort of in a race to see which will be the 15th state to allow same-sex marriage. But at the same time, there are lots of states where same-sex marriage is not legal, and a number of them have reinforced their, their not making it legal by having constitutional amendments to forbid it, so that, that they want to defend themselves against future court action and things like that. So why, why do I call that a repugnant transaction? Well, it's precisely a kind of transaction that some people would like to engage in. They'd like to marry each other, and other people don't think they should. And you know, in the United States, the, the laboratory of democracy, you know, the states of the laboratory of democracy, we're fighting it out, right? In California, same-sex marriage is legal. In Oregon and Nevada, it's not, right? Actually, I'm not sure about Oregon. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're watching get debated. It's a hot-button issue. How about slavery? We used to have markets for slaves in the United States. Right? That used to be a legal market. And that's a funny one because it's not a voluntary transaction on the part of the slave. But how about indentured servitude? That used to be the most common way to buy passage across the Atlantic Ocean. You'd be sitting in Ireland and you'd want to come to Boston and you wouldn't have the money to, um, to pay for, for your transit. 
And the ship captain in Ireland would say to you, no problem, sign these articles of indenture, and when we land in Boston, I will auction your labor services off for five years, unconditional, to the highest bidder in Boston Harbor. And that's what would happen. And it was a voluntary transaction, right? The, the guys getting on the ship in Ireland were signing papers. But the 13th Amendment to the Constitution forbids any kind of involuntary servitude. We decided that this was a market that we find is repugnant. Uh, at the same time, other kinds of things that were repugnant, it's, it's hard to imagine now how we'd run the world economy without them. So interest on loans was a repugnant transaction in Europe for centuries. I think the Catholic Church had strong opinions about that for a long time. Um, it's hard to imagine how we'd run global capitalism without a market for capital. Right? So today, banks can charge interest on loans, and, and that's how we finance you know, all sorts of things that go on in the world all sorts of international trade. So notice that the arrow of time points both ways. It's not that as we get more modern, things that used to be repugnant become less repugnant. It goes both ways. You know, indentured servitude used to not be repugnant, today it is. Interest on loans used to be repugnant, today it's not, except in Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, so, so these are things that change over time and place. So for example, and they're not all, you know, these, these are all important ones. They're not all that important, but why can't you eat horse meat in California? I'm guessing that no one had horse meat for lunch today. Okay? And, you know, the short answer is it's against the law. It's a felony in California to sell horse meat for human consumption. And this isn't some ancient cowboy law when a horse was a man's best friend. This was passed by referendum in 1998. Just about as many people voted it for it as voted for Gray Davis for governor that year. So, the reason there's a law against eating horse meat in California is not because no one in California wants to eat horse meat, right? There's no law in California against eating cockroaches, right? Nobody wants to eat cockroaches. You don't need a law against eating cockroaches. The reason there's a law against eating horse meat is some people would like to eat horse meat and other people don't want them to, okay? So it's a repugnant transaction. It's a transaction that for good or ill in California we have passed a law against. Um, I'm blocking on the name. Some British princess, I think Princess Anne, just yesterday gave, she's the chairwoman of the British Association of Horse People. And, <laughs> and she gave a, a speech yesterday saying that, that eating horse meat should be legal in Britain because that would eventually cause horses to be better taken care of because it would make them more financially valuable. So you can love horses and think that we should eat horse meat, and you can love horses and think that we shouldn't eat horse meat. These are complicated questions, so repugnance is hard to study. Now, although I don't know what makes something repugnant, one thing you can observe is that often something isn't repugnant until you add money. So interest on loans. No one was against loans. They were against making money from your money. Payments to birth mothers and adoption. It's expensive to adopt a baby, but you can't buy the baby from the mom. Right? You can't pay the birth mom for the baby. You can pay some of her expenses, and those are different in different jurisdictions. Okay? Prostitution. By and large, what we don't like about prostitution is the payment, not the promiscuity. Right? The things that are illegal are, are cash. And of course, you can have different opinions on this, but most people have no trouble picking out the economist in this cartoon. This poor guy has, has come to dinner, and he says, you know, we didn't have time to pick up a bottle of wine, you know, here's $50. Well, right, you can, right, so whatever you think about repugnant markets, you can tell most of us have some sense that there are some things for which money isn't appropriate, right? If you invite me to dinner at your house, I can't reach into my wallet after dinner and say, you know, that was a wonderful dinner, you know, that would cost at least $50 at a nice restaurant. Can I just, you know, leave that by my plate? You know, you say, you know, what's the matter with this guy? Doesn't he understand, you know, we're not a restaurant. He can't pay us for meal. You know, inviting him to dinner is a, an act of friendship. And so, of course, he could bring a bottle of wine. He could invite us. He could say, you have to come to dinner at our house sometime. But you can do a lot of reciprocal things, but you can't pay money. So we all have some idea that we may, we, we may have different ideas than our neighbors about which things are okay to buy and sell and which aren't. But most of us have some idea that there are some times when you shouldn't be pulling out your wallet. So one of the things I like to do when I talk about this is I like to get a show of hands on how do you guys feel about carefully regulated sales of live kidneys. Who would be willing to, to try that in the United States? Should we be selling kidneys? Okay, keep your hands up, please. Because my next question is, 
How about hearts? It kills the seller. Mm, you know, so yeah, a couple of guys still have hands up, yeah, yeah, but not everyone. So the point is, a lot of people have their hands up for some transactions and down for other transactions. So we feel, so, so we should understand that some people feel repugnance for some transactions, even if it's not the ones we feel repugnance for, right? So, so we have to think about which things are okay to support markets for. And, you know, many people were up for kidneys and down for hearts. Go figure. So kidney exchange it achieves some of the benefits of a market without using money, and therefore it didn't run into this repugnance. So there are lots of benefits of a market. There, there are gains from exchange. Kidney exchange are exchanges we can do. Kidney sales aren't exchanges we can do. It's good to do the ones we can do. You know, what, what makes market design part of economic engineering is we're trying to make things work better. We may not always be getting them to work as well as they could in an ideal world, we're trying to make them work better in this world. And, you know, those of you studying economics, that's a, a good thing to try to do. I think I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of time. Thank you. You spoke about a lot of interesting areas uh, where uh, mechanism design was used. Um, what other areas of our society do you see need for this type of examination of more optimal designs? Well, I think lots of markets need to be designed and redesigned. You know, the, the, the kidney exchange has changed over time as we've learned to do new things, and, and so we now do it differently than we used to. Um, I was talking to a group of students uh, earlier today, and we talked about uh, financial markets and high-speed trading and how very high-speed trading makes markets work differently than when people are trading at human speed. And so that we, we may need to rethink whether trades are conducted continuously on the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade, or whether they should be conducted you know, once a second, which is very fast in human standards, but slow by computer standards. But, but as we see algorithmic trading, we have to think about whether we need new rules, new market designs for financial markets. Thanks. It's fascinating. Can you describe, uh, you started the with game theory and experimental economics. What was your transition to move to mechanism design toward real world applications? Well, you know, the nice thing about being an academic is you get to schedule your own mind. You get to think about things until you're ready to say something about them. And so it takes a long time before you're ready to give advice. You have to, you have to feel like you know something. Um, Incidentally, I mean, the, this is, you know, there are plenty of great careers where you get to think about interesting problems every day. The special advantage of being a professor is you get to think about what you want to for as long as you want. And the re what, what took a transition was, you know, we, we didn't understand enough about these markets to give confident advice about them until we did. Incidentally, I didn't, I didn't actually decide to become a market designer. I was sitting in my office at the University of Pittsburgh in 1995 and the phone rang and it was, the guys who ran the medical match saying they had a crisis and would I, would I help uh, direct or redesign the match. And I still remember the visceral feeling you're on the phone thinking, gee, I'm sorry I picked up the phone. <laughs> because I knew why they called me. You know, you, the feeling is, you know, why me? And, and you know, this book I signed for you. you know, I'd written a book on matching. But the parts of the book that were going to be directly applicable to designing the match were the counterexamples. You know, in the book, I'd said things like, Oh, you know, if you've got couples, that makes the problem hard. Well, when you're just writing a book, you're done when you say that. You, know, you show that couples make the problem hard. But when you're redesigning the match, you have to put the couples into jobs. And so I've learned a lot since then. And my taste in theory and my, my taste in what we're trying to learn has changed a lot from, from agreeing to take on the responsibility of trying to put the couples into jobs. Thank you. Last question for me. What, what do you think could be done to teach business or economics better at university? Well, I'm a big fan of using experiments in class. So, you know, if you think back to high school, one of the things that made physics an exciting class was you could do experiments and you could see dramatic things. I, I remember in my high school physics class, one of the things they had was a bicycle wheel on an axle that you could hold in your hand. 
And when it was spinning, it was hard to turn. And that's how you really understood that there was this physical law called conservation of angular momentum. You know, it's hard to turn a bicycle. That's why it's easy to ride a bicycle. It's because the bicycle is helping you keep erect. Well, in economics, we can now do experiments too. We can run markets in class, and, and you can watch them converge to competitive equilibrium, things like that. I think that those are, you know, I still remember holding that bicycle wheel in the physics class. And I think that my students remember watching price discovery happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's open it up. Uh, Wilson, are you in the audience? Can you come home? Okay, come down. So, I guess, what is your process uh, uh, going about to come up with a solution? What's the... Like, when you, when you approach a problem like the kidney exchange yeah. or uh, figuring out the high school, yeah. what is your process of going about it? Well, first you have to learn a lot about it, you know, so I remember um, our first meeting with Boston Public School when we said to them, you know, we think there's a problem. So instantly, the, the, so different problems are different. So New York City was like a patient with a heart attack. They were having 30,000 kids a year on match. They called us. Boston, we said to them, you have a problem. They didn't, it was like a patient with high blood pressure. They didn't know they had a problem. It looked to them like everyone was getting their first choice because you had to be really careful to get your first choice. So we tried to convince them that they had a problem. and we, they, they allowed us to look at their data and spend a year convincing them. But then when we came to talk to them about, about solving the problem, I remember a meeting where they said, you know, professor, it's always dangerous when people call you professor. Um, he said, you know, professor, schools are complicated. And I don't know what possessed me, but I, I tried to tell a joke. I said, you mean, you mean we can't model Boston as a circle with the, stu with the students uniformly distributed you know, over the circle? And there was this silence where I thought, you know, I've just screwed up everything. And then everyone laughed, and we were okay. And we spent another year you know, really understanding the city of Boston. You can't send kids across the water in Boston. So kids from East Boston can't be assigned schools that involve a bridge or a tunnel. So, you know, things like that. So until you know things like that, you can't talk to Boston about assigning kids to schools. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand what they already do and why they do it and which are the things they have to do and which are the things they can change. And then we try to work through a process. So change is mostly incremental. And, that, and that's another way this is like economic engineering. You know, when you're building a new bridge, you try to build a better bridge than last time, but it's going to still look like the last bridge you built. And that's a little bit the way all of these things work. We started with kidney exchange. We started, we made a proposal that looked a lot like what we're doing now. But what our surgical friends said to us is they said, you know, it's complicated to do kidney exchange. If you really want to help us get going, help us figure out how to do just pairwise, just two pairs at a time. And so for the first two years, that's all we did. And you can figure out how to do that well. And then slowly we convinced them that it would be really good if you could do three-way exchanges and eventually long chains. So, so it's been an incremental process. We're now doing most of our exchanges through long chains, but the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that sort of legitimized that didn't happen until 2009. So it's, it's incremental. You build on what you got, you try to make it work a little better. Thank you, Professor. I was just going to ask you, um, I know that in markets you're clearing, you try to use price to clear the market. Like by finding the right price, that's when all the buyers and sellers have, to, have, done, have cleared that market with, by finding that price. So in game theory, or when you're talking about like the Boston schools, some participants in the market are more able to play the game better and get a better outcome than other. So how do you, how do you factor that part in? Okay, let, so your question has two parts. Let me, let me uh, address both of them. Uh, when you talk about the markets where you set price so that supply equals demand, when we teach you know, economics one, that, that's the way we talk about all markets, but it turns out that really describes just commodity markets. Those are markets where you don't care who you're buying from. So if you're buying 100 shares of AT&T on the New York Stock Exchange, you don't care who you're buying from. It's just the price that matters. The job of the New York Stock Exchange is to find the price at which supply equals demand. You don't worry how well the guy you're buying from has taken care of those shares while he's had them. He doesn't worry whether you're going to take good care of them. So it's not a matching market. If you can afford it, you can have it. But 
as I started off, you know, that's not the way Stanford decides who goes to Stanford. They don't just set the tuition high enough so that just enough kids want to be freshmen. They, they set it low enough so that it's high, but low enough so that lots of people would like to be students at freshmen, as freshmen, and then they select them. So, so it's not a price at which supply equals demand. The demand for Stanford seats is greater than the supply at current Stanford tuition. So now there's the question of the, the second part of your question you asked. You say, so, that, so it's a complicated process. There's an admissions process. There's an application process. There might be interviewing processes and courting processes. How do we try to level the playing field? So the phrase level the playing field is actually something that uh, Tom Payson, the, the superintendent of schools in Boston, when he was explaining to the Boston School Committee why he supported the change that we were proposing, he said it because it was level the playing field. So remember, the old... Boston way of assigning schools meant you had to be really clever to play the game. You had to figure out which schools you could get into and, and list those as high preferences. So about 20% of Boston families didn't play the game well. And the way you could tell was they sometimes, under the old system, if you, there were a lot of schools, but if you didn't list them as your first choice, you couldn't get them. But about 20% of Boston families were listing as their second choice schools that no one had ever gotten except as a first choice. So they were making a mistake that cost them. Their kids would, would eventually get assigned to schools that still had places available after everyone had been assigned to the schools they wanted. So the current system takes the strategy out of it. The mechanism is what we call dominant strategy incentive compatible. That is, um, dominant strategy truth telling. It's safe to, to put your first choice to the school you want best, even if you have low chance of getting it. It's safe to put your second choice school second, your third choice school third, and so forth. And the way the superintendent of school saw this is he said, you know, one of the attractions of this is it levels the playing field. It gives all families equal access to the schools, not just the ones who, are, who can figure out how to play the game. Because now the game is simple to play. Uh, in your matching program for I can't school, see you. Raise yeah, your hand. I see you. Great. In your matching program for schools, at least in San Francisco, our public schools for younger children have had the problem of, like, disparity in income, yeah. did that ever come into your equation where you see that the wealthier students go to the wealthier or the schools that get more donations? So you're talking about the public schools? Yeah. Well, so there's a big debate in American cities about whether schools should be local or citywide assigned. So the people who like local schools, one of the things they say is parents are more involved, you know, the parent teacher associations are, do more, the parents walk their kids to schools and they, they help make sure kids aren't playing in the street, things like that. The people who like school choice say, you know, not everyone lives in a neighborhood that has a good school nearby and, and part of the equal rights of citizenship should be letting people, uh, you know, choose the schools they want and let the poor schools get smaller. And, and the big schools get larger, the good schools get larger. It sounds to me, I, I'm not deeply familiar with the problem you're mentioning, but it sounds to me like what you're saying is the, maybe the parent-teacher organizations are raising money for the local schools and that the schools that are in high socioeconomic status neighborhoods raise more money. That's a tricky problem because um, you'd hate to stop well-to-do parents from, from contributing to their schools. Uh, we have that problem writ large in the United States because unusually for developed countries, we finance our school systems through local property taxes. So uh, San Francisco schools get money from San Francisco uh, real estate taxes. Oakland schools get money from Oakland real estate taxes. So if San Francisco is a wealthier city than Oakland, then the problem that you're seeing School by school, we also see city by city, and San Francisco and Oakland are very near each other. So that's a peculiar feature of the American system of school finance. And there have been states like, I want to say Vermont, but it might be Maine, uh, there have been states that said that, that they tried equalizing this across the state. They said towns can't raise the part of their property tax that goes to schools without contributing generally to the state revenue. This turned out not to be good for for Vermont schools because it, it sort of was good for private schools in Vermont because states, because affluent towns now became reluctant to do what they used to do, which is raise taxes and have, have well-funded schools because they couldn't keep the money they raised. So these are complicated questions of finance. If we had a different system of financing schools, it would play out differently. Um, so I'm not sure if this is a very realistic question, but it might be in regards to more of like a hypothetical situation. 
is it possible to create some sort of centralized algorithm that might be on a more local scale, be able to quote unquote match make like allies and like global governments or like organizations and NGOs for to create like a more cost um, beneficial relationship like mutually rather than allies maybe benefiting more on one uh, side of a political or like, social relationship than the other? I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you try once okay. again? Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, but would it be possible to create a centralized algorithm that might hypothetically be, uh, create a more like mutual beneficial relationship between, on a small scale, local governments or NGOs so that the two parties involved might mutually benefit in a greater well, scale okay. than... Well, so, so most trade is mutually beneficial, most voluntary trade. That's why the question of repugnant transactions is such an interesting one, since since lots of transactions that people enter into with good information and you know informed consent uh, benefit them. So I'm not quite sure I understand the question. In the sense that when you think about a job market, I get a benefit from being employed by Stanford, and Stanford gets some benefit from employing me. So so it's a mutually beneficial transaction, and we tend to think that if there's some competition, if there are other universities who employ professors, or if there are other professors who are willing to teach freshman seminars, then then um, then, then the, the transactions will have to work well to, to give some benefit to both sides. Now, um, now sometimes things can get out of balance. There are markets with asymmetric information or markets with, with uh, big differences between supply and demand in which um, sometimes we feel that one side doesn't get enough benefit. And you see institutions developing like labor unions, for example, that, that try to give more bargaining power to one side of the market. Um, we, you know, this is probably why we find indentured servitude repugnant. Right? That's a very asymmetric contract, labor contract, where where you can't quit. Um, so, so that's a market design innovation. You know, the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution is a market design innovation that says certain kinds of very asymmetric contracts will no longer be legal in the United States. Um, but by and large, we, you know, by and large, I think contracts freely entered into are beneficial, and now the question is how to distribute the benefits. And the question of deciding what's more or less equal, you know, these are fraught political questions. Think about our recent presidential campaigns and things like that. You know, we're, as a country, we're highly divided about how much we want to uh, redistribute national wealth and how much we want to let it accrue, you know, how, how we feel about income inequality, for example. Right? So these are, are big political questions that, that continue to divide. So I don't, you know, that I, uh, you know, as a market designer, I think if you, if you tell us what you want to do, we might be able to help you do it. But, but that's something that as Americans, we have trouble figuring out what we want to do. So, so right now, the voting system for presidential elections and whatnot, I would say is not very well designed because if you were to vote for your for the independent, you would be taking away a vote from the person that you really, you know, your second best choice was like very poorly designed. So my question would be, how would you design it? So like the, the optimal voting system that makes the most amount of people happy with their decisions. That's a great question. So two offices down from mine at Stanford is Ken Arrow, who won one of the first Nobel Prizes in economics. And one of the famous theorems he proved is called Arrow's General Possibility Theorem, which is sometimes called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. What it says is there are no ways to set up voting systems that will make collective decisions look as rational as individual decisions. And so this is something that he formalized in a very nice way. But the early theorists of democracy were, were guys who were slain in the French Revolution, uh, like the Marquis de Condorcet. And what he observed is, supposing you have majority voting, one of the things that can happen that, would, that I would think would be really odd if it happened in your choice, is you might prefer, let me start with an individual. It would be really odd if you preferred candidate one to candidate two, candidate two to candidate three, but you like candidate three better than candidate one. But it's easy to set up preferences so that majority rule produces that kind of cycle. That is, we can have three voters, and two of us prefer candidate A to candidate B, two of us prefer B to C, and two of us prefer C to A. So right there, the Condor, Marquis de Condorcet, right before the French Revolution, he observed that, that 
you might have intransitive cycles. The, the thing that you talked about, how voting for a third party candidate might, might not be what you want to do, even if he's your first choice, is what Arrow referred to as, as a failure of independence of irrelevant alternatives. Right? So one criterion that you would like, apparently, is that voting for someone who doesn't win shouldn't change who wins. But one of the things Arrow showed us is you can't, you know, there's a pretty short list of things and you can't have them all unless you have a dictatorship. Right? Dictatorships look like individuals. So if you want the voting outcome to look like an individual, there's a way to do it, but it's not one we like. <laughs> let, let me end actually on this. You know, um, I just gave a talk to some audience, and, and right before me was Condoleezza Rice, who had been the Secretary of State, and, and she kept referring to America as a country of free markets and free people. So when I finished my talk, I said, you know, as an economist, when I think what's a free market, as a market designer, I think a little differently than politicians do. I don't think of a free market as, as a market that has no rules. I think of it as a market that has rules that allow it to work freely. And I think a good metaphor is when you think of a wheel that can rotate freely, you think of a wheel that, that has an axle and bearings that are well oiled that allow it to rotate. When we think about markets that work freely, we think about markets with good sets of rules. The New York Stock Exchange has lots of rules. It's not a market where anything goes. You can't trade before 9 a.m., you can't trade after 4 p.m. Those are rules made by the exchange. And then there are rules made by the government. You can't do insider trading. You can go to jail for breaking some of those rules. But collectively, they help the market work freely. They help it do price discovery. They help it aggregate information. So when we think about free markets, we should think about what allows them to work freely. And that's what market design is about. Thank you very much, Al. If you be my bodyguard, I can be